This is where the real crux of the issue starts. So you pull these people in the workforce and like, you compete with each other. They start competing for wages. So guess what? Nobody needs to pay higher wages. These people have been promised the American dream. That was the dream of the 50s. They saw their parents have that and the baby boomers never got any of it. They got something entirely different. They got this weird world where fiat currency was being gradually debased, not like we have these days, mm -hmm. but gradually debased by inflation and to, you know, money supply issues, stuff like that. And asset prices start to rise. The British, I think, were the first to leave the gold standard over that period. The French left, the Americans left, pretty much every country in the world. I think it was yep. like 80-odd countries. So many people defaulted because yep. of the cost of war, right? That's yes. a, another yes. typical thing right. that destroys currency is the cost of warfare. It's, it's right. the most expensive thing governments ever spend on. Yep. It's one of the features of today and why we've got so much debt is the cost of wars that we fought that we could never pay the bills for. Right. So. You know, all of the precedents are all there. So then what happens is World War II. Mm -hmm. And this is where the story really starts. So the collapse of the British Empire leads to World War I, which leads to the rise of Hitler, which re leads to World War II. 70 million people die. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's unprecedented. It's three and a half times the size of the number of people who died in World War I. Mm -hmm. And again, that was the shock that brought the next thing, which is the unexpected thing. Those things were kind of expected because, you know, geopolitics, they, they, they trend in certain ways. Yes, there was unintended consequences of the shooting of Archduke Ferdinand for World War I, but the collapse of the British Empire leads to vacuums of power, mm -hmm. much like when the US pulls out of the Middle East, it leaves a vacuum of power in the Middle East. Right. And before you know it, you create warfare and eventually everything settles down once people figure out their new role in, in, that, in that new, in, in the region. Mm -hmm. So World War II finishes, and here's the bit where humans made a mistake. What do they do? They're euphoric, and they go and have sex, and they create <laughs> the largest population boom the world has ever seen. And what happens in America is 78 million people were born in a 20-year period. The population grew by 40% in 20 years, and the global population grew by 30% wow. in 20 years. Can you imagine if the US opened its borders and the population was allowed to increase by 40% from immigration? What would that do, right? Okay. And everybody thought they were doing it rational because what had happened after World War II was the New Deal. Mm -hmm. And the New Deal was this fiscal stimulus, and this will become relevant when we get much later in the story, mm. was this fiscal stimulus where they basically, again, imposed financial repression by capping the yield yields, yield curve mm -hmm. control, mm -hmm. allowed inflation to run relatively hot. It wasn't super hot, but it was hot, hotter than bond yields mm -hmm. to lower the burden of debt. But then they fiscally stimulated in an unprecedented manner never seen before in world history. Mm -hmm. That stimulus and, and the Marshall Plan of rebuilding Germany and rebuilding Japan, mm -hmm. that stimulus created the boom of the 1950s. And the 1950s and 1960s were probably the last golden age we ever saw, um, where real wages were rising. People's standard of living was going through the roof as the technology that got developed during warfare turned into consumer goods like washing machines and cars. Right. And everybody had access to it. Labor was still relatively inexpensive. So that's what part of where there was the politics of nostalgia. So... Typically, on the left, oh, on the right of the political spectrum, um, whether it's the UK or whether it's the US, they look back at the 1950s as the golden era, mm -hmm. the golden era where life was simpler. Now, it was very different. Longevity of life was very different and all of those things. But there was this boom period because of the end of World War II, the rebuilding of global economies, things that can almost never be replayed, but may get replayed in the future mm -hmm. because of things that are going on now. So. That goes on, and this the world also retools its entire global infrastructure and becomes mm -hmm. globalized. So as opposed to being empire-based, it becomes this rules-based global order system. Right. So 1944 was Bretton Woods, which is the tying of all the currencies together to the gold standard pegged to the US dollar. Mm -hmm. 1946 was the United Nations. 1947 was the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trades. 
1949 was NATO, 1957 was the EU. So these are the super infrastructure of the world that we've all grown up in. This is the, the centralized power of globalization. And that was put in place to avoid what had happened in the past. So meanwhile, let's go back to these baby boomers. 1967, the first of them start entering the workforce, you know, hit their 20s and they start entering the workforce. Mm -hmm. Great. For the first of those guys, amazing. 1975, the average baby boomer is now in the workforce. Mm -hmm. So you've got the highest increase in people in the workforce ever. And two things happen. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. Firstly, prices explode. Because if you think when you first got your first job, what do you do? You rent an apartment or, you know, right. you, you, you have to buy a in the old days, a suit and tie, you have to buy tables and chairs, you have to you buy yourself a car, your marginal rate of consumption explodes. Yeah. When you're doing that on a global basis, it explodes beyond anybody's comprehension. Right. It's the largest demand shock the world had ever seen and will ever see. We will never repeat anything like that again. So obviously supply can't catch up with demand. So the oil price goes through the roof, all commodities go through the roof. Everything goes through the roof. And so everybody's scrambling to catch up. America can't deal with running twin deficits and being pegged to gold. It's losing its gold supplies. Yep. Its currency is too strong. And in 1971, Nixon walks away from the whole thing. Yep. And we go to the fiat money system because it's unmanageable with this population boom going on and the rising inflation and all of the other pressures that are going on. By 1986, the baby boomers enter the workforce. Uh, sorry, the last baby boomer enters the workforce. Mm -hmm. So you've got this period, which we refer to as the great inflation, which most people think of as being a monetary phenomena. I think is a demographic phenomenon. I can mm -hmm. prove it in every chart that I look at proves that it was demographics. Right. The monetary side, of course, played a role. But the reality was, if you were to put the same setup anywhere in the world, regardless of what you're pegged against, You've got the same demand shock, and the world can't keep up. Right now, as we're talking, we've got a supply shock. So, you know, the demand has, has, has risen to normal levels, but supply has massively contracted. So prices rise. Mm -hmm. That tends to be, it tends to be offset quite quickly because as things come on, the general level of prices stabilizes again. Mm -hmm. Sure, the price doesn't fall, it never goes back, mm -hmm. um, you know, but it, but it kind of stabilizes. So the other part of that equation is not the inflation. <clears throat> the really big story is the one that nobody understands, is that wages stopped going up. Mm -hmm. So in real terms, obviously, if you add a record number of people, like if you added record immigrants into the US right now, what happens? Wages don't go up. Right. And in fact, they never went up again. Mm -hmm. In real mm -hmm. terms, since 1975, wages haven't gone up. They've gone up. 0.3% a year right. for the median American. And this is the infamous decoupling from productivity growth, right? Correct. Yeah. Exactly. Because GDP grew yeah. because of financialization. I'll come on to that in yeah. a minute. This is where the real crux of the issue starts. So you pull these people in the workforce and like you compete with each other. They start competing for wages. So guess what? Nobody needs to pay higher wages. These people have been promised the American dream. That was the dream of the 50s. They saw their parents have that, and the baby boomers never got any of it. <laughs> they got something entirely different. They got this weird world where fiat currency was being gradually debased, not like we have these days, mm -hmm. but gradually debased by inflation, M2, you know, money supply issues, stuff like that. And asset prices start to rise. Their wages don't. Mm -hmm. And this is the key thing, is if your assets rise and your wages don't, your future self is poorer mm -hmm. because an asset is a way of storing wealth for future consumption. Mm -hmm. But within this is an uglier picture as well. If you split the population down between, with kind of percentiles, the lower percentiles saw zero increase in wages, complete mm -hmm. zero. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the worker working in a, you know, flipping burgers, you know, 
production a factory worker zero increase right. the average the median as we said okay the median worker saw about a 33 percent increase in real wages in 50 years which is incredible compared to what happened to gdp and productivity right. yeah and then the average guy because it takes into account the really wealthy skew mm -hmm. Well, their wages have gone up 100% over those 50 years. So you're already seeing that bifurcation in people. If you think of that, and we'll come on to a lot more about this in a bit, but if you think of politics now, you think of the left and the right and the extremes of left and right, mm -hmm. talking about not the, you know, the middle ground, but the extremes of left and right are both really fucking angry because they've been left behind. And nobody knows why, so they, they blame it on politics. <laughs> but the reality is it's people having too many kids. Right. So they are really angry because both those parties have this base of the poor, but in different parts of the country. And those guys' lives never improved. They were promised a dream that never happened. They live in the world's richest nation and they never got any of it. And then all they're bombarded with is the imagery of the beautiful rich getting richer and how great America is. Do you want to know one thing about crypto? I made over 3,000% in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn 500,000, 1 million dollar, you have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70 in the traditional financial system and you probably will still be broke and you will be old. This is not a sexy combination as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where to start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany, as you can hear, and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them. And if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange. And one of the biggest are, for example, Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well-established exchanges. But, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much, much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy, but the moment he recommended Dogecoin, it went through the roof, to the moon, so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who, and you have to react before he is reacting. This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail, and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.